Hello, good evening, and welcome back to the third of three um, in our series on Christian mysticism with the amazing Peter O'Leary, right? Those of you who have been here a time or two, like, he's pretty great, isn't he? And those of you who have already watched the first two videos, you know, and if you haven't, go back and check them out. So, um... This is an event uh, sponsored by Spirit and Light, which is a Catholic collaborative for living faith between the two parishes of St. Edmund Ascension and St. Catherine, St. Lucy, St. Giles. So um, we welcome you tonight um, to this. And uh, so let's start with a little prayer. Hmm? So this is from uh, Teresa of Avila, who we will be hearing about in a little bit. Let nothing trouble you. Let nothing trouble you. Let nothing scare you. All is fleeting. God alone is unchanging. Patience, everything obtains. Who possesses God, nothing wants. God alone suffices. And so we pray this evening for patience, for trust, that we can live our lives in the spirit of God. And we pray all things in the holy names of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And without further ado, I'd like to bring up Dr. Peter O'Leary. Thank you for the introduction and the prayer, Marcy. And it's great to see everybody, um, everybody here. So... We're going to do the, th I'm get, getting a little bit of an echo. Is it a little loud? Yeah. Why don't we turn it down just a little bit? But, yeah, I think that's better. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. So the topic of this evening's third and final of these lectures is mystical union with God. Okay? Um, and towards that end, we're going to... Um, we're going to, to refresh ourselves with the, the three parts of the path that we've been discussing um, over the course of these three lectures, just to, to, just to get it back in our minds, especially since we had a two-week two gap since the last one. Um, so the classic formulation of the threefold way to mystical union with God was first uh, offered by an unknown figure who called himself Dionysius the Areopagite after the person who appears in the 17th chapter of Acts. We don't know anything about this person, but most likely he was a Syrian monk who lived in the early 6th century. Um, they hypothesized that based on the, the Greek that he used in his writing. Uh, it seems to have, you know, developed in that direction. And furthermore, uh, there was a, there was there was an activity, a, an, an interest in, um, in Plato and Neoplatonism at that time in Syria, and it really was infusing Christianity at the time. Or this, these monks who were thinking about Christianity in this way. So Dionysius taught through. Um, his coinage of the word hierarchy, that the universe consists of a sacred order, a state of understanding, and an activity approximating as closely as possible to the divine. By envisioning this hierarchy, the soul is brought back to union with the hidden divinity. The process of vision, according to Dionysius, involves three stages. The first stage is purification, which you'll remember is also catharsis. Then the second stage uh, is illumination, which is 
theoria, which we discussed two weeks ago. <clears throat> and then the third stage, this, the topic for this evening's lecture is, is union or henosis. Henosis comes from the Greek word for one, hen, and osis, that, that suffix, refers to the process of something happening. So it's the process of becoming one, the process of one-ment, you could say. Um, but it's also, importantly, uh, it's, it's, it's because the union, that the oneness we're talking about is... is connected to, obviously, to God. We can also refer to this as, and we will be, as theosis, which is just the Greek word for deification, um, the process of joining with God, becoming God, becoming God-like. <clears throat> I think we can also think about it in terms of what we might call a powerful longing in the soul to return to God. So part of this, um, part of the, the, the nature of this process, which is threefold, it's not so much that the first stage is a foundation, the second stage is something that you build on the foundation, and the third stage is the attainment of the goal. It's more, it, it, it operates more in this, in this fluid um, back and forth process. That is to say, there's the sense that we are separated from God, and then there's this desire to return to God. And so you're, you're, you're modulating, in a sense, you're modulating through this process of recognition. And the recognition is sometimes this process of purgation, this process of purification or catharsis. It's sometimes a process of visualization, this theoria or this contemplation, this illumination. And then, uh, as we're going to see this evening, it involves glimmers of expectations of experiences of, of union with God, which can also be experienced as a desire for that union, okay? They, 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 operate, they operate on a similar frequency. Um, so this third fold in the way of God is the path of mystical union uh, called theosis in Greek, which becomes deification in English. And that's drawn from, from the Latin deificatio. Of the three folds in the way, union is the aspect most oriented to the age to come suffused with apocalyptic anticipation, one that originates in the heart, which is the center of the human person, the root of its active faculties, and the core from which all spiritual life proceeds. And that's a kind of, uh, that's a feature you find in so much writing that moves in the direction of mystical union, which is there's this, this focus on the heart, metaphorically, physically, the heart is the heart of the matter. <clears throat> I'm going to write. A, I'm going to give you a, a, a fabulous quotation here from um, Vladimir Lasky, who's the gentleman represented there. Union with God, writes Lasky, is a great scholar of Christian mysticism is a mystery which is worked out in human persons. I love that. Union with God is a mystery which is worked out in human persons. This suggests that the spiritual life drawn into union with God will be guided by the life and experiences of the person pursuing them, which means darkness, confusion, even despair, along with illumination and understanding. The body, especially the heart, in which, all, in which all our powerful feelings reside, should not be an obstacle in mystical experience, according to Lasky. Quoting him again, the body must be spiritualized and become, in the words of St. Paul, a spiritual body, 
Our ultimate destiny is not merely an intellectual contemplation of God. So from the standpoint of this pursuit, even though it might originate in the imagination or the mind, the nose, it has to transform into the body, into the spiritual body. <clears throat> Our ultimate destiny is not merely an intellectual contemplation of God, but a bodily absorption into the enduring energies of God, which no longer appear as exterior causes, as goals you strive towards, but as grace, as interior light, quoting Lasky again, which transforms nature in deifying it. This transfiguring encounter with the energies of God alludes to apocalyptic glimpses of the ends of things. This is a quote from Lasky. In the parousia, which is just another term for the second coming, in the parousia and the eschatological fulfillment of history, the whole created universe will enter into perfect union with God. This union will be realized, or rather will be made manifest differently in each of the human persons who have acquired the grace of the Holy Spirit in the church. But the limits of the church beyond death and the possibilities of salvation for those who have not known the light in this life remain a mystery of the divine mercy for us, on which we dare not count, but to which we cannot place any human bonds. Uh, likewise, love, it's a, it's a complicated thought, but he's, he's proposing effectively that salvation is universal. It must be. But we don't, we don't and we can't understand how that's going to operate. We, we, can't, we can't place any human bonds on it. We can't, I can't create a set of categories that's going to determine who, who is saved and who's not saved. Who attains to union with God and who doesn't. That's not, that's not the nature of this. <clears throat> and I love that it's going to be manifest differently in each of the human persons who have acquired the grace of the Holy Spirit. Nice. So, what is, what is it like to move through life into this mystery? So, in this lecture, we will be led by four guides. Evagrius Ponticus, one of the transformative fig, uh, thinkers in the early church. St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, two revolutionary mystics, Carmelites, and each other's spiritual counselors, and both doctors of the church. And then finally, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the 20th century Jesuit and paleontologist whose mystical vision shows us a way forward into the unknown of the future, rushing ceaselessly towards us. So, let's start with Evagrius. Um, there's some little factoids there for you if you're curious. Some of these are going to come up in the material I'm going to provide for you here. So Evag Evagrius was a courtier and deacon who became a monk who lived in the province of Pontus on the Black Sea. Hence was he called Evagrius Ponticus. Evagrius was a deep admirer of Origen. And uh, you have his years there. Origen was a second and third century Greek theologian and scholar and one of the spiritual giants of the early church who produced a great range of teachings and writings but who is perhaps best known for the heresies he was condemned for. You might notice there's a kind of repeated theme here is that some of these spiritual innovators, they make all of these amazing claims and discoveries and then at a certain point... It's like, whoa, let's put the brakes on. Well, they did it with, with Origen. Uh, he was condemned uh, for a number of heresies, which included especially this doctrine of apocatastasis, uh, which is a Hellenistic philosophical teaching that there will be a restoration of the constellations at the end of the cosmic cycle. That sounds obscure enough that, okay, I guess we're going to, condemn that as a heresy, uh, but what it is gesturing towards, and this is the, this is the, the nature of, of his, 
his so-called heresy, what it's gesturing towards is that the punishment of the souls of demons and impious humans uh, is temporary. And that salvation is universal and that all shall be restored to union with God. That's the implication of the apokatastasis. Universal salvation. And that was a problem for some at the time and remains a problem. Amazing, here we are 2,000 years into Christianity and some people are still like, not that person. We don't want that person saved. <clears throat> Origen, was, he wasn't having it. Nor was Evagrius. So he accepted the bulk of Origen's theology, which um, included the doctrine of apocatastasis, and both of them were condemned at the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 553, you can Google that or Wikipedia it, and you can find out exactly why they were so condemnable. Nonetheless, his role as a monastic guide and spiritual counselor has preserved for us his writings in which he develops a sophisticated and subtle psychology of prayer life, insisting on a doctrine of pure prayer, free from words and images, one saturated by the divine like the sky is saturated by blue. And Evagrius identified apatheia as a goal. We get our word apathy from this, obviously. But it meant something, it meant something more refined in his imagination. Uh, so apatheia is a goal which is a state of serenity in which struggles and torments subside, yielding to gnosis or knowledge of God. So apatheia leads to gnosis. <clears throat> he believed completely in the ability of the soul to receive God's generosity and mercy. He wrote, we come to this life possessing all the seeds of the virtues, and just as tears fall with the seeds, so with the sheaves there is joy. Once the intellect, the nous, finding itself through diligent prayer in a state of grace, clears itself of all thought and all passion, it can then perceive in its own sapphirine nature, like the sky at last, ready to be filled with the light of Christ. So I'm going to give you just a couple of his, a couple of his teachings to um, his fellow monks, which I think you'll appreciate. <clears throat> this is from a, a compilation of just uh, they're really just like little bits of advice. There's 150 of them. They're all short and it's called On Prayer. So he says do not let your eyes be distracted during prayer but detach yourself from concern with body and soul and give all your attention to the intellect. Another saint living the hesychastic life in the desert. Hesychastic life is the life of contemplation. This life of quiet, of quietness. Quietness and watch, watchfulness. Another saint living the hesychastic life in the desert was attacked as he was praying by demons. Who for two weeks tossed him like a ball in the air. Catching him in his rush mat. They were completely unsuccessful in distracting his mind from fiery prayer. When another monk was practicing inner prayer as he journeyed in the desert, two angels came and walked on either side of him. But he paid no heed to them, for he did not wish to lose what was better. He remembered the words of the apostle, Neither angels, nor principalities, nor powers shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. That reminds me of, uh, there's a famous uh, Zen Buddhist koan, which runs, if you're walking on the road and you encounter the Buddha, what should you do? And the response is, kill the Buddha. And you, you kill the Buddha because your attachment to seeing the Buddha is preventing you from awakening your Buddha nature, according to the teaching. So it's comparable. This monk is, you know, flanked by angels, but it's like, nah. Like, you guys are pretty impressive, but... <clears throat> Never try to see a form or shape during prayer. 
Do not long to have a sensory image of angels or powers or, or Christ, for this would be madness. It would be to take a wolf as your shepherd and to worship your enemies, the demons. Self-esteem is the start of illusions in the intellect. Under its impulse, the intellect attempts to enclose the deity in shapes and forms. I shall say again what I have said elsewhere. Blessed is the intellect that is completely free from forms during prayer. Blessed is the intellect that, undistracted in its prayer, acquires an ever greater longing for God. Blessed is the intellect that, during prayer, is free from materiality and stripped of all possessions. Blessed is the intellect that has acquired complete freedom from sensations during prayer. Blessed is the monk who regards every man as God after God. Blessed is the monk who looks with great joy on everyone's salvation and progress as if they were his own. Blessed is the monk who regards himself as the off-scouring of all things. A monk is one who is separated from all and united with all. A monk is one who regards himself as linked with every man through always seeing himself in each. The man who always dedicates his first thoughts to God has perfect prayer. If you want to pray as a monk, shun all lies and take no oath. Otherwise, you vainly pretend to be what you are not. If you wish to pray in spirit, be detached from the flesh, and no cloud will darken you during prayer. And trust to God the needs of your body, and it will be clear that you entrust to him the needs of your spirit also. If you receive what has been promised, you will reign over all things. And keeping these promises in mind, you will gladly endure your present poverty, spiritual and material. Let the virtues of the body lead you to those of the soul and the virtues of the soul to those of the spirit and these in turn to immaterial and principial knowledge. <clears throat> this comes from the Philokalia, which is the collection of spiritual writings that were uh, circulated and then gathered together um, from the monks and the monasteries of Mount Athos in, in Greece. So it comes from the Orthodox Christian tradition. St. John of the Cross. We've all heard of the dark night of the soul. Alas, we've all likely experienced at least one of these ourselves. But you may not know that the phrase comes from John of the Cross, one of the most profound and penetrating and compassionate figures in the history of Christian mysticism. Born in Spain, he entered the Carmelites in 1563. In 1567, he met Teresa of Avila, joining her Reformation movement. In 1577, he was captured and imprisoned by Carmelites who didn't take kindly to the reforms he was emphasizing. Just think about that. The Carmelites, these are, they're monks and they're nuns. And they're like, let's put him in prison. It's insane. Insane. Like, that, the dark night of the soul came because fellow Carmelites imprisoned him. I would feel really bad too. In response to his imprisonment, in part, he composed wrenching and ecstatic poetry, as well as systematic commentaries on his own poetry as a means of shedding light on his experience. These include The Dark Night of the Ascent of Mount Carmel, as well as The Dark Night of the Soul, both of which address the harrowing process of the purgative path of purification, while two later works, The Spiritual Canticle and The Living Flame of Love, take up the illuminative and unitive paths. John of the Cross commanded an instinct for metaphor as propulsive and intense as that of the greatest poets. Indeed, his poetry is as canonical as his theology and as foundational as his reformations. With Teresa, he is regarded as the founder of the discalced Carmelites, so eventually they decided to break away from the other Carmelites. Uh, and he was canonized in 1727, I'm sorry, 1726, and declared a doctor of the church in 1926. I'm going to give you a little taste. This is... Uh, I have the first stanza here. Um, I'm going to read. It's, it's a total of uh, eight stanzas. It's not very long. 
But that's the whole title of the poem. Songs of the soul in rapture at having arrived at the height of perfection, which is union with God by the road of spiritual negation. That's a good title. That is a good title. Upon a gloomy night, with all of my cares to loving ardors flushed, O venture of delight with nobody in sight, I went abroad when all my house was hushed. In safety, in disguise, in darkness, up the secret stair I crept, O happy enterprise, concealed from other eyes, when all my house at length in silence slept. Upon that lucky night, in secrecy, inscrutable to sight, I went without discerning and with no other light except for that which in my heart was burning. It lit and led me through more certain than the light of noonday clear to where one waited near whose presence well I knew there where no other presence might appear. O night that was my guide, O darkness dearer than the morning's pride, O night that joined the lover to the beloved bride, transfiguring them each into the, into the other. Within my flowering breast, which only for himself entire I save, he sank into his rest, and all my gifts I gave, lulled by the airs with which the cedars wave, over the ramparts fanned, while the fresh wind was fluttering his tresses. With the serenest hand, my neck he wounded and, suspended every sense with its caresses. Lost to myself, I stayed my face upon my lover having laid from all endeavor ceasing and all my cares releasing through them amongst the lilies there to fade. It's good. This is translated by Roy Campbell. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, and one of the things you find in as I mentioned in the work of John of the Cross is that he would then take the text of his poems and he would, he would effectively interpret them himself. He would go through them stanza by stanza and provide these detailed commentaries, which allowed him to narrate the process of um, his experience in this dark night of the soul and beyond. But I think uh, in line with one of the things I mentioned all the way back in the first lecture, what you, also, what you also gather from his writings is his sense that the metaphors that he was generating to represent his experience, like in those metaphors, that's where the meaning lies. You know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't using his, it wasn't the experience itself that was the great authority for, for what happened to him. It was the metaphors that he was able to generate as a result of the experience. So he puts all sorts of stock in that, which, I mean, he's an extraordinarily gifted poet, um, though he's primarily, you know, remembered as, as a mystic and doctor of the church, along with his, his, close, his close companion in this regard, St. Teresa of Avila. Um, amazing that they lived at the same time, these two towering figures. So Teresa is the first woman to be declared a doctor of the church, uh, born to a family of Jewish or origins, entering the Carmelite order in 1535, and then experiencing a conversion to an even higher state of contemplation 20 years later. In 1559, the Grand Inquisitor of Spain published a list of forbidden books that included many of the works of devotion and mysticism that had been guiding Teresa and her nuns in their spiritual life for years. She was disappointed, <laughs> to say the least, that these books were essentially being, uh, being removed from, from her and her, her, fellow, her fellow monastics' usage. Uh, so it's at this point that Christ appeared to her and said, do not be distressed, for I will give you a living book. That's encouraging <laughs> at that moment, right? What followed for Teresa were the visions, experiences, and ecstasy that compelled her through the rest of her life, inspiring her to initiate the reforms of the Carmelite order she undertook with John of the Cross. In 1560, 
she experienced a rapture of God, which she described as a piercing of her heart, wounding her with love. Now, this was not an uncommon trope for women mystics of the late medieval period, and it aligns with Julian of Norwich's experience, if you recall that from two weeks ago. But Teresa's experience was unusual, if only because it was so lucidly related in her autobiography. This piercing became known as the transverberation, which, owing to its power, was accorded its own feast day by Benedict the 13th in 1726. <clears throat> transverberation. Let's get a little taste of that. This pain and this bliss carried me out of myself, and I could never understand how it was. Oh, what a sight a wounded soul is. A soul, I mean, so conscious, so conscious of it as to be able to say of itself that it is wounded for so good a cause. It sees distinctly that it never did anything whereby this love should come to it, and it sees that it does come from that exceeding love our Lord bears it. A spark seems to have fallen suddenly upon it that has set it all on fire. Oh, how often I remember when in this state, those words of David, as the heart longs for the fountains of water, so is my soul longing for you, O oh my God. They seem to me to be literally true of myself. And, and in 1599, I'm sorry, in 1577, Teresa composed The Interior Castle a work of vivid allegorical power in which she envisions seven mansions in the castle of a king which describe the process towards union with God in the form of a rapturous mystical marriage with the Trinity at the center of the soul. In this work, she provides illuminating language, simple but poetically charged, for the experience of union. And then I'll give you a little taste of that as well. So, the mysterious, so mis, I'm sorry, so mysterious is the secret and so sublime the favor that God thus bestows instantaneously on the soul that it feels a supreme delight, only to be described by saying that our Lord vouchsafes for the moment to reveal to it his own heavenly glory in a far more subtle way than by any vision or spiritual delight. As far as can be understood, the soul, I mean the spirit of this soul, is made one with God who is himself a spirit and who has been pleased to show certain persons how far his love for us extends in order that we may praise his greatness. He has thus deigned to unite himself with, to his creature. He has bound himself to her as firmly as two human beings are joined in wedlock and will never separate herself, himself from her. This is not so in the spiritual marriage with our Lord, where the soul always remains in its center with its God. Union may be symbolized by two wax candles, the tips of which touch each other so closely that there is but one light, or again, the wick, the wax, and the light become one. But the one candle can again be separated from the other, and the two candles remain distinct. Or the wick may be withdrawn from the wax, but spiritual marriage is like rain falling from heaven into a river or stream, becoming one in the same liquid, so that the river and rainwater cannot be divided. Or it resembles a streamlet flowing into the ocean, which cannot afterward be disunited from it. This marriage may also be likened to a room into which a bright light enters through two windows. Though divided when it enters, the light becomes one and the same. One of the things you'll notice is she's working her way without anxiety through a whole series of metaphors for describing what she's experiencing. So rather than trying to pinpoint it, rather than trying to come to some conclusive description or some conclusive metaphor, instead she's allowing them to proliferate. And the language is very similar to the language we got in uh, the poem by John of the Cross, because very similarly, there's, there's something more like poetry that happens in this type of mystical thought than, let's say, uh, a kind of rational discourse or a rational doctrine. 
Um, one of the things, one of poetry's powers, its enduring powers, is its, its ability to snip the thread of logic that otherwise binds thoughts together. And once that thread is snipped, the thoughts are able to expand and move and harmonize, um, interact with the, mel the various melodies of, of thought itself. Okay, our fourth and final figure. Oh, that, you probably recognize the famous uh, sculpture of Bernini here, which is the ecstasy, of, the ecstasy of St. Teresa, which is, you know, it's, a, it's hard to believe that's made out of marble, isn't it? It's, it seems to actually, like the marble itself is visualizing ecstasy. Here we come to Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Um, he's referred to as Teilhard, if we're gonna go, you know, if we're referring to him by his last name. <clears throat> Typically, that's how you find it in the writings. He was born in Orsine in France in 1881 and died on Easter Sunday in New York City in 1955, 73 years old. According to Emile Rideau, who wrote an extensive guide to Teilhard's thought, Teilhard had a vivid imagination, predominantly visual. It made great use of the multiplicity of sense impressions, giving them rich verbal forms in a variety of metaphors and symbols. In 1899, he entered the Jesuit novitiate making his first vows in 1901. And for a decade's time, he furthered his studies in the sciences and theology in England and Cairo, becoming ordained as a priest in 1911. His main training was in paleontology, specifically the study of human origins. So not dinosaurs. In 1914, uh, he served as a stretcher bearer during the First World War for which he received citations for valor. After the war, he entered the University of Paris, earning his doctorate in 1922. And from there, he traveled to China and onwards to Mongolia, uh, to the Order Desert, where he worked for several years, living in Beijing, but doing his fieldwork primarily in Mon Mongolia. Though his best known scientific contribution occurred closer to Beijing, where he was involved in the discovery of Peking Man as this this uh, early hominid is known. At the time, the oldest hominid ancestor discovered anywhere from uh, 300,000 to seven, 780,000 years old. Teilhard was passionately compelled by his discoveries and work to synthesize a new theology of evolution. He began to write his two most influential and dazzling works, The Phenomenon of Man, which explores the uh, theological science of evolution and the divine milieu, which explores the mysticism of evolution. Neither book was published in his lifetime nor any of his theological works because he took his vow of obedience seriously, which means when he would write these books, he would submit them to his elders in the Jesuit order and they would say, no, we're not going to publish this. this you can't publish this. Um, too much. And he, I mean, he, he, he never seemed to really complain significantly. Obviously, in his letters, you would find him frustrated, but he adhered to the vow of obedience that he took. He did, however, publish a lot of scientific writings in his lifetime, those he was permitted to publish. His books, however, began to appear immediately after his death. Like, it seems like he died and then within a year, they were all the, many of them were being published. Uh, and, they, and, and they quickly became essential. Um, although the controversies they awakened uh, have persisted. In 1962, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith condemned several of his works. More recently, eminent Catholics, especially Pope Francis, showing his own Jesuit scientific colors, but also Pope Benedict XVI, one-time leader of the congregation, 
<clears throat> the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. They've both cited Teilhard's work very favorably. So I feel like maybe a, um, an important corner has been turned when it comes to, when it comes to his work. You know. If I had anything to do with it, he would be Saint Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, but maybe someday. Teilhard's writing, uh, if you haven't gathered yet, one of my all-time favorite thinkers, Teilhard de Chardin. I love his thought. I love the way his mind works. I love to read his writings. Teilhard's writing is replete with expansive and far-reaching concepts, as well as a peculiar, inventive, and always mysterious vocabulary to support his imagination, especially words like convergence, centration, cerebralization, psychogenesis, and hominization. I'm, that's like, that's, that's the tip of an iceberg. At the center of Teilhard's thought, at which converge cosmic evolution and a theandric theology, are two radiant concepts, that of the noosphere and that of the omega point. <clears throat> The noosphere is Teilhard's coinage for the phosphorescence of thought that enwraps the earth, which he believed visible from space. It is the culmination of hundreds of millions of years of evolution from chemistry through biology to life itself, whose complexities enabled the formation of the soul, which he called the psychogenesis, onward and outward to the mind, the noogenesis, through which the imagination endlessly activates and radiates. And this is a quotation from the phenomenon of man. And even today, to a Martian capable of analyzing sidereal radiation psychically, no less than physically, the first characteristic of our planet would be not the blue of the seas or the green of the forests, but the phosphorescence of thought. Come on. That's, that deserves a wow. Wow. That deserves a, uh, yeah, wow. It's, it's, it's an amazing visualization. And not surprisingly, just as a footnote, uh, he, he's beloved of certain tech thinkers. His vision of the noosphere is metaphorically identical to the internet. So, so there, there, are, there are people who think of Teilhard as effectively forecasting this. But he's thinking of something, for me, much more dynamic and ultimately better than the internet. Uh, let's hope. Which is just that there's this, that, that, that there's something tactile. There's something, there's something visible and visualizable in thought, the energy of thought. It's really wonderful. The Omega Point, describes the convergent eschaton of life where the divine and the human come together in a supremely autonomous focus of union. So, to parse that out a little bit more, because this is a heavy concept. It's this convergent eschaton, that just means the end point, convergent eschaton of life, both human and divine, where divine creation itself continuously harmonizing, that is, becoming more and more human. So what Teilhard hypothesizes is that all of creation, everything that God created, is in this constant process of harmonization, becoming more and more and more human. It doesn't mean that humans are populating the universe. It means that as human consciousness deepens and centers, the universe becomes more and more human. And that's the purpose of creation. Okay? So humanity is, uh, as it's becoming, as creation is becoming more and more human, humanity is continuously divinizing. That is, becoming more and more divine. Uh, and that, at this omega point, those two elements meet and recognizing the other once and for all as the same completely unite. So put another way, <clears throat> humankind, having been created, 
becomes more and more divine. God, the creator, becomes more and more human as humans become more and more divine. And at a certain point, we're going to see each other as if in a mirror, but in seeing each other, we're going to recognize, we're going to recognize the other as ourself. And at that point, there's a complete union. God will have been totally humanized or harmonized. Humans will have been be totally divinized. We'll become the same. So he, he calls to repeat, he calls this a supremely autonomous focus of union. In its emergence, it is impersonal. In its goal, it is utterly personal. Dynamically, I'll use a Teardian word, intercentric and flowing with love. In other words, Christ. Christ. Or, as Teard has it, Christ Omega. He likes to he likes to coin. He likes to coin things. So, two passages for you. One from the phenomenon of man and one from the divine milieu. It give you a great taste of how he writes and thinks. No, no agenesis, that is this creation of the mind, rises upwards in us and through us unceasingly. We have pointed to the principal characteristics of that movement, the closer association of the grains of thought, the synthesis of individuals and of nations or races, the need of an autonomous and supreme personal focus to bind elementary personalities together without deforming them in an atmosphere of active sympathy. And once again, all this results from the combined action of two curvatures, the roundness of the earth and the cosmic convergence of mind in conformity with the law of complexity and consciousness. Now, when sufficient elements have sufficiently agglomerated, this essentially convergent movement will attain such intensity and such quality that mankind taken as a whole will be obliged as happened to the individual forces of instinct to reflect upon itself at a single point. That is, that is to say, in this case, to abandon its organoplanetary foothold so as to pivot itself on the transcendent center of its increasing concentration. This will be the end and the fulfillment of the spirit of the earth. The end of the world, the wholesale internal introversion upon itself of the noosphere which has simultaneously reached the uttermost limit of its complexity and its centrality. The end of the world, the overthrow of equilibrium, detaching the mind fulfilled at last from its material matrix so that it will henceforth rest with all its weight on God Omega. That's like science fiction, poetry. It's the best. The best. And then one last little bit taste for you. This is from the divine milieu. <clears throat> like a huge fire that is fed by what should normally extinguish it, or like a mighty torrent which is swelled by the very obstacles placed to stem it, so the tension engendered by the encounter between man and God dissolves, bears along and volatilizes created things, and makes them all equally serve the cause of union. Joys, advances, sufferings, setbacks, mistakes, works, prayers, beauties, the powers of heaven, earth, and hell, everything bows down under the touch of the heavenly waves, and everything yields up the portion of positive energy contained within its nature so as to contribute to the richness of the divine milieu. Like the jet of flame that effortlessly pierces the hardest metal, so the spirit drawn to God penetrates through the world and makes its way enveloped in the luminous vapors of what it sublimates with him. It does not destroy things nor distort them, but it liberates things, directs them, transfigures them, animates them. It does not leave things behind, but as it rises, it leans on them for support and carries along with it the chosen part in things. Teilhard. One loves Teilhard. Well, this one does. Okay. This is the, this is the rousing conclusion. 
The desire for contact with the divine defines the life and work of the mystic seeker. Evagrius believed that the prospect of union with God surpassed the sin that mires the seeker in the world, spurring us outward and upward. St. John of the Cross expressed his experience of the divine in a uniquely ravishing annihilation that emptied him, which St. Teresa herself felt as piercing transverberation. And Teilhard theorized, that is, illuminated, how union might be conceptualized in universal terms, visualizing for us the language and light of things. But what, after all, is touching the divine like? Returning to the traits of mystical experience William James provided for us in the first lecture, we might say it is ineffable, noetic, transient, and passive. We might also say, following Dionysius, that it is like a vision of divine darkness whose dazzling thickness we experience as a cloud of unknowing. Perhaps above all, it is a superabundant encounter with life's constantly generated overplus, an energetic exchange of the sense of saturation and negative capability that course through knowledge and sensation. Though he was not a Catholic, let's not hold that against him, Thomas Traherne, poet and chaplain who lived in the 17th century, has written one of the finest works of Christian spirituality and reflection that we have, The Centuries of Meditation, not discovered until 1896 and not published until 1908. Uh, they were discovered, basically tucked in a library. <clears throat> so I'm going to give Trey Hearn this evening's last word. O oh, Jesu, Lord of love and Prince of life, who even being dead art greater than all angels, cherubims and men, let my love unto thee be as strong as death and so deep that no waters may be able to drown it. Oh, let it be ever endless and invincible. Oh, that I could really so love thee as rather to suffer with St. Anselm the pains of hell than to sin against thee. Oh, that no torments, no powers in heaven or earth, no stratagems, no allurements might divide me from thee. Let the length and breadth and height and depth of my love unto thee be like thine unto me. Let undrainable fountains and unmeasurable abysses be hidden in it. Let it be more vehement than flame, more abundant than the sea, more constant than the candle in Aaron's tabernacle that burned day and night. Shall the sun shine for me and be a light from the beginning of the world to this very day that never goeth out? And shall my love cease to intermit, O Lord, or shine to shine or burn? O let it be a perpetual fire on the altar of my heart, and let my soul itself be thy living sacrifice. And that's it. I think uh, Tim is going to uh, allow for a certain amount of Q&A. Oh. Yeah, Marcy had to go home early, so I'll be passing the mic tonight. Um, thank you so much for one more time. That was beautiful. Uh, last of the three sessions, we've hit our, our omega point here. <laughs> it was wonderful. So um, any questions? I'll be glad to. Here we go. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, a union, annihilation, transverberation, convergent eschaton. Th there's like a Borg quality here, you know, like you're going to be assimilated. But the last Chardin thing was autonomous. If maybe you could describe in, in all of these things that are, that we're assimilated into, mm -hmm. if you could describe where the autonomy where the personhood, where we are as individuals? That's a really, that's a really good question. Now, the quote from 
uh, Teilhard about the omega point is the influence, uh, the omega point, he calls the omega point the influence of a supremely autonomous focus of union. So the autonomy there, as I understand it, is, is it's, it's systemic. I want to say that rather than systematic. That is, it belongs to the system. That the system, the system has this, let's call it a kind of self-governance or a self, self-direction. And you'll remember that he claims about it that it begins impersonally, but it resolves supremely personally. So it's almost like the, it's almost like, because he's thinking of it, I think evolutionarily, it's like, um, it's, it starts with this, it starts with this, this um, geosphere. You have, you have, you have elements, you have minerals that are bound together. And as they begin to react, they start to involve themselves in chemical reactions. It turns into the biosphere. So life becomes, you know, life is the next sort of urgency. But as that urgency exists, it, and it continues to become more complex and to interact more intrinsically, that's what yields to, eventually, to, to, to what he calls the, the psychogenesis. That is, the point at which creatures, living creatures, begin to recognize in each other a quality of life that is dear. A quality of life that we, you know, we now refer to it as a soul, um, but it's this, it's this, this property of being alive, being a, being a living creature, and then from there, we the, the complexities intensify, and this turns into this phosphorescence of thought. We start to, and as that happens, it gets more and more personal, like at each stage, more and more personal. So, I agree that there, particularly if we're uh, if we if we want to try to unify all of these 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 ideas about mystical union with God, we're going to come up with we're going to find ourselves addressing some contradictions or at least seemingly contradictory impulses, especially this notion of annihilation or like uh, Evagrius's sense of pure prayer, prayer in which there's no images, in which there's no you know he wants even to kind of strip you of for you to be stripped of feeling, in a sense. Um, and yet, and yet, I think that they all align in certain, in certain ways, particularly when it comes to the notion that union with God and the desire for union with God are, are very hard to separate. So that means we can think about it abstractly, impersonally even, but we also can... And, and should think about it personally at the same time. I do, I do hope that it's a, it's a both and situation as opposed to uh, an either or. Not that you were suggesting that at all, but thinking aloud, I feel like there's a way in which, yeah, you're gonna deal with, they're generating powerful metaphors and they don't necessarily follow, follow a rational trajectory. Yeah, I feel like that was an insufficient, but Sincere answer to your question. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. So I have two questions. Um, the first one, as I'm sitting with this, hearing from you know you about all of the different mystics and looking at mystics from other traditions, the the description of the experience seems to have similar qualities to sexual union. Oh, definitely. And and yet, I know I've practiced personally, and I know other practices that follow like the body sensations to a path of union as well. And and a lot of in some of the Christian um, writings, and even like the Philokalia that you quoted, is it's like detached from the flesh. And and I know there was a point in church history where. Yeah. Flesh became evil, bad, sinful, you know, the spirit kind of became this split. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about kind of the body and sexuality in a, a kind of a, a mystical union with the divine experience. Mm, yeah, 
That's a great, I think that's a, a great and important question. And, you know, I don't know that I can come up with a better answer than that. Like, yeah, I want more of that, please. <laughs> like, yes, transverberation. You know, it's, it's so, so I feel like even at the point where within, within the, the Christian, within the Christian thought complex, there tends to be um, the, the, the privileging of the spirit by way of the uh, mortification of the body. And you find that in many other spiritual disciplines. It's not limited to Christianity, but Christianity also tends to regard the body as stained with sin. And I think that you find that in, in certainly a lot of the mystical discourse that you can encounter. That said, I, I think that even the, even the, the these um, advocates for mystical union, each of them has something really powerful to say about the body and its place in mystical pursuits. You know, Evagrius, I think his embracing of, of Origen's notion of the apocatastasis, it really was, uh, you know, there's an argument, and I find it persuasive, that people like Origen and Evagrius, who were emphatic about this particular doctrine, had that been founda as foundational as Augustine's understanding of sin and redemption and grace, we would have a different, it would be a different Christianity we'd be practicing or experiencing these days, which is to say that sin would undoubtedly be part of it, but maybe not so emphatically, you know, to the point where uh, you're going to associate, and I'm, I'm making a broad generalization here, and um, um, I hope I'm not one day condemned, uh, but we might not so quickly or readily associate the body with sin in that regard. So Evagrius's embrace of that, but I think, I think you know, the Carmelite mysticism is, it's deeply embodied because it has so much to do with has so much to do with these harrowing feelings, but then also rapturous ecstasy, which uh, is not out of the body. It sort of it expands the body. And then Teilhard, I mean, he, he's, he's just constantly thinking about, he's constantly thinking about a person, what it is to be a person, and a person in the universe striving toward, towards union with the divine. So I feel like you're making a, a really important point, um, but I don't find, and I'm not sure if I'm putting words into your mouth here, but I don't find it necessarily to be um, so emphatic in Christian mysticism as you might imagine. I find that there's just a lot, there's just a lot about the bodily experience, the body, bodily connection to the divine that happens in in these writings, which is part of what makes them so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. You had a second question. Thank you. Um, oh. Yeah, there's a, it's, there's a variation in terms of my mic and that mic, yeah. but it's being handled. Okay. Yeah. Related or, related or not to the first, um, I'm wondering in your studies, of, of those that you've presented in this series and just in other studies, what like which of the, these mystics were to our knowledge and to your studies LGBTQ because I wonder that representation gets left like of us queer folk being left out of sure. the history of Christianity and mysticism so I'm curious yeah I can't speak to that at least in terms of some sort of biographical identity but there's a long standing let's call it uh understanding that especially people who are pursuing cloistered monastic life, that that becomes a place for, uh, it's, it's actually the, the, the challenge in talking about 
these people um, in contemporary terms like you know queerness, LGBTQ, uh, and other sorts of and other sorts of words that we use, because those characterizations didn't exist for these most of these people at the time. That is to say, with those particular labels, it can be sometimes a little bit um, misleading to talk about somebody like Teresa, let's say, as queer, but because I don't know. Um, on the other hand, I think that present, now I'm going to editorialize, I think in the present day, we have a real um, inclination towards labeling our, ourselves in all sorts of identity, um, all sorts of identity formulations. And um, one of the things that I find valuable in looking back at some of these writers is uh, they weren't they weren't providing those sorts of labels for how they looked at themselves or the world, and somehow that makes it more open for me, at least. You know, uh, we talked about Julian of Norwich two weeks two weeks ago. You know, it's just like a truly remarkable figure uh, who seems like if you wanted, you could you could use her as this 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 outstanding feminist archetype. Um, but was she that in her own mind? I don't know. I, I really, I don't know and I, I wouldn't want to necessarily speculate, but I would hope that people today encountering her work would find that aspect of her and her life inspiring. Um, so I take your point. I think it's a really important one, but I'm also hesitant to make any claims because I, I just don't have any knowledge or, or expertise in that regard. Um, however, personally, so just speaking experientially, I find that this writing, this material, it's constantly opening things up. It's constantly opening things up. And that is always, the universe moves towards openness. You know? Like, history shows us that our instincts show us that when we close things down, when we limit things, it's not as good as when we open things. And these figures, they're at the leading edge, and they're just prying it open as readily as they can. So I find them, I find them inspiringly available. You know? And when I teach this material um, to my students, I teach at the Art Institute, which is, you know, it's... There's a lot of queer students. That's how they engage with the material. Like, that's my experience. They find it that way. Um, I don't want to speak for all of them, but that's a, I feel like that's a, a generalization that, that I'll stand by. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Just one last point. Um, the dark, when you were reading The Dark Night of the Soul, um, the lines from there jumped out at me because if you know Lorena McKennett, she's a Celtic singer, songwriter, folk. Um, she has a beautiful song called Dark Night of the Soul that's, oh, really? that's put to music in a really profound way oh, to some of those lyrics. So for anyone oh, who's that's interested. Good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, good connection. So I'm trying to recall back to your opening statements about Yeats. Yeah. And... Yeah. and your sensibility and the way you just choose to share all this insight, um, it all goes back to metaphor and poetry, and it all goes back to language, mm -hmm. and that the philosophy of language is only capable, I mean, language is only capable of pointing toward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's helped me understand what union might mean. And your last comments about openness it's not union as in now we've created a whole and I get it. It's, it's the encounter with radical otherness. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate the way you've not said that, but <laughs> meant it, <laughs> if I'm correct. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's good. And, uh, and I'm not going to comment. It's good enough. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> well, once again, thank you very much, Peter O'Leary. My pleasure. <laughs>